Welcome back. Uh, in this video, we're going to continue learning about uh, energy, and this is coming from ebook chapters 1 4 and 1 5. So, after reading those uh, sections and watching this video, you should be able to identify a system and a surroundings for a given chemical or physical process, apply the first law of thermodynamics to relate internal energy changes to work and heat, assign positive and, ne and, positive and negative signs to internal energy, heat, and work under different scenarios, define a state function and give examples, and then define enthalpy and differentiate between an endothermic and exothermic process. Let's talk about what a system is and what the surroundings are. And the system is usually a subset of material that um, dis is distinguished from the surroundings, which is all of the rest of the matter in the universe. And in chemistry, the system typically ends up being the chemicals or the chemical reaction, but um, the easiest way to generalize is that the system is the stuff that we care about. We're typically measuring something about the system. And so we can talk about the internal energy of the system. And this is uh, the energy that's stored within the system. Um, and this is kind of a generic term because it doesn't describe anything more than that it's stored within the system. Um, energy can change when chemical or physical reactions occur. And so we talk about there being a change in energy. And that's what this symbol delta, this is the Greek letter delta, and this means change. So we talk about the change of energy. And that is the difference between the final state and the initial state. So if our system loses energy in the surround, to the surroundings, the change in energy is less than zero. It's going to be a negative value and it goes from a high initial state to a low final state. However, if the system gained energy from the surroundings, then that's going to be a positive value, a positive change in internal energy, and our initial state is going to be lower in energy than our final state. As the energy leaves the system or enters the system, it can either be done in the form of heat or work. Heat um, is going to be related to temperature changes. And you can get heat exchanged when there's a difference in temperature. When we think of a chemical reaction doing work, you might think of um, an explosion causing a large increase in volume of a gas. Um, whereas if you do work on the system, then maybe you're pushing down on it and you're compressing it into a smaller container. So if we talk about energy being lost to the surroundings, again, that means our uh, total internal energy is going to be less than zero. And that could be in the form of uh, heat, where heat is exiting the system, or work is being done by the system. And again, if we're talking about energy being gained by the surroundings, then that could be heat entering the system or work being done on the system. Now, there are some important things to note. Um, because internal energy is the sum of the heat and the work, you could have a positive heat and a negative work, but still have a net positive increase in uh, change in internal energy, or vice versa. Maybe you, so uh, your work is um, positive, or excuse me, the, the heat is positive, the work is, is, is negative, but the magnitudes are different. So you have negative 10 units of energy for heat and no, me, we'll say positive 10 and negative 15 of work and so that's a negative total change in internal energy. So when you have differing signs for your heat and your work you simply add them together to determine what's the total change in internal energy. Now this brings us to an idea of what's called a state function. So a state function is a property that depends not on the path or method used to get to a specific state, but it only depends upon the current state of the system. So here's an example that we might see in chemistry. Let's say that you have a hot beaker of water. So you've got 100 grams of the water, and it's at 100 degrees Celsius. If you cool it down to room temperature, it's going to release heat into the surroundings. 
and it's going to have a set amount of internal energy, which is lower than what it started. Or you could take that same mass of water, and maybe it started at zero degrees Celsius, so it had some ice cubes in it, and we increase the temperature, we heat it up, and get it to 25 degrees Celsius. In both cases, the beaker of water is going to end at 25 degrees Celsius and have 100 grams of water in it. Therefore, the internal energy is going to be the same between those two different scenarios. Even though they started at different uh, in energy amounts and they took different paths to get to their final state. Because the internal energy is the same regardless of the path, it's what we call a state function. And there are other examples of state functions in chemistry. Uh, the most notable examples that we will deal with are temperature, pressure, and what we will soon uh, learn about which is called enthalpy. So the temperature uh, of a system doesn't matter what path you took to get there, it's just based upon the uh, temperature at any given moment. Same for its pressure. You take a gas and you increase the pressure, then decrease and increase and decrease. All that matters in the end is its current state. What is its per current pressure? And then enthalpy as well. And we'll get more into that when we talk about what enthalpy is. Um, heat and work, however, are not state functions. So it turns out that the amount of work that an object can perform does depend upon the path that it does. For example, if you take, um, let's say that we have a large object and um, we uh, a rock, let's say, and we drop the rock uh, onto a glass jar, it will do work and break the jar. However, if the glass jar is not underneath the rock when you drop it, even though the rock took that same path or it, it fell down, its path was different because it interacted with different things and therefore the work that it did was different as well. Let's give you um, another example of a state function. This is one that might be a little bit easier to understand. It turns out that elevation is a state function. So your elevation depends not upon the path that you take, but only upon your actual location. For example, let's say that we're starting um, at the bottom of a mountain and you want to climb up to uh, a particular location at the top of the mountain. It doesn't matter if you were to take the more rapid, perhaps arduous blue path versus the more meandering, uh, longer yellow path, your elevation is going to be the same. What is different, however, is the amount of energy that you expended. And I think this is another good example of uh, showing that the amount of work that is done does depend upon the path that was taken. So to put this back into chemical terms, we might say that you have one chemical reaction where it gives off heat, and another where it gives off heat, a smaller amount of heat, but some amount of work. If the sum of those differences is the same, then the total change in internal energy is going to be the same. Um, this is another way of looking at that same idea. Perhaps we're doing a chemical reaction where we're converting from reactants to products and there is an intermediate step. The identity of the intermediate step will affect the energy of that intermediate However, it, if, as long as it doesn't affect the final product, then it doesn't matter which path you take. The change in energy from reactant to product is going to be the same. Now let's talk about what's called enthalpy. Enthalpy is where we transfer heat at a constant pressure. And most chemical reactions that we deal with are done at constant pressure. If you melt water, if you boil um, liquid water and convert it into steam, those are done at constant pressure, and therefore the amount of heat that's transferred is called enthalpy. This essentially allows us to look at heat as a state function. And we also know that enthalpy change is related to the change in internal energy. This uh, equation here comes from the ebook, and we're not going to go through the uh, derivation of it. Uh, you, I'll leave that to you to look in the ebook if you're interested in it. 
But essentially, all we need to get from this, we need to come away with is the understanding is that enthalpy is a state function. It's the heat transferred at a constant pressure. And when that is done, then it doesn't matter what path you take so long as it's constant pressure. So the reason why this is true is because generally speaking, at constant pressure, for many chemical processes, the change in volume is small. Therefore, our change in internal energy is going to be related to just the enthalpy change. Because we often think of enthalpy in, in form of heat, um, we can talk about processes that gain or lose heat. And the terms that we use are endothermic and exothermic. A reaction is exothermic when heat exits the system, when the system loses heat and the surroundings gain that heat. The surroundings would be getting hotter. A reaction is endothermic when the system gains heat, when it enters the system, endothermic, enter, the surroundings lose that heat and they get colder. So how this would be observed is, let's say we have a chemical reaction. We're doing it here in a beaker. We take some sort of a salt. We put it here in water. And you have a thermometer. If the initial temperature, let's just say, is 10 degrees Celsius, and our final temperature here is 20 degrees Celsius. Our thermometer is not part of our system, but the thermometer is part of the surroundings. Remember, the chemicals are what we are looking at in terms of the system. Since the thermometer, which is the part of the surroundings, observed an increase in temperature, that means that the thermometer gained the energy from our system. and the system lost heat. That then is an exothermic reaction. However, if we do a similar reaction, put in a different salt, and this time our temperature, instead of uh, going from 10 to 20, goes from 10 to 0 degrees, then again, that's our thermometer that's reading that temperature change, and the thermometer lost heat. It went from high to low, which means that the system gained the energy, and therefore that was an ex, or excuse me, an endothermic reaction. So a big key in identifying whether a reaction is endothermic or exothermic is to remember that the thermometer is part, it, it, it views the change in temperature from the perspective of the surroundings. Okay, let's have you practice now. Uh, go ahead and pause the video, read over the question, and try this on your own. Welcome back. Let's work through the solution to this. So we want to consider a process. Let me move that video. There we go. Pause again if you didn't get to read all that. Okay. Uh, we want to consider a process in which a system loses heat and performs no work. Amount of potential energy remains constant through the process. Which statement must be true? Internal energy of the system decreased. The sign of heat is negative for this process. And the system lost kinetic energy. Well, what do we know? We know that the system loses heat. Therefore, the change in heat must be zero, or excuse me, less than zero. We know that, uh, therefore, the sign must be negative for this process. We know that the amount of work that is done must be zero. Therefore, when we sum together the total work and the heat exchange, we can just relate the heat to the change in internal energy. Since the heat was negative, the change in internal energy must also be negative, telling us that number one is true. Now, since uh, the energy is negative, 
but potential energy remains constant. Our kinetic energy must have decreased as well because total energy goes down, potential remains constant, therefore this must also go down. And so our system also lost kinetic energy. And that leaves us with answer choice E. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.